Uh, thank you, Cindy. And uh, I want to thank, I'm uh, uh, the executive vice chancellor and provost here at UCLA. For those of you who are not part of the academic structure, that makes me sort of the chief operating officer of the institution, chief academic officer. And um, this is a wonderful evening. I want to thank all of you for coming. We have some special guests here that I want to acknowledge. Uh, uh, very, we're very fortunate to have the councils, councils generals uh, of Egypt, Kuwait, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka here, and the vice council of Turkey. So I want to give them all a hand. Thank you so much for coming. And I, I, I think your presence uh, really uh, helps us kick off this uh, International Education Week, uh, which is really important here at UCLA. We are, after all, here in an international city and in an international institution. Uh, we at any time have about 12,000 students or scholars here from overseas as part of our campus and campus community. And they add a vitality and an, a depth that was really important. At the same time, of course, we want to educate our students to be able to go out and navigate their way internationally in a world that is increasingly interconnected. And they have to understand those interconnections and be able to deal with them. And so I, it, I was walking over here trying to think of what I should say. They had prepared remarks, but I thought, well, what's, you know, what would be a good way of talking about international here at UCLA? And I thought, well, uh, one thing is uh, it's very fitting that International Education Week is getting kicked off in a library. Because after all, libraries are inherently international. They're not local. They collect the wisdom and knowledge and background from every corner of the world, not just one place. And so when you're in here, you are in, in, in an international locus. This is what we are, and that's what a library is. But even more fitting is Powell Library. And if you look around yourself and think about it, this is an international institution. You go out, the two iconic buildings were designed not with usual American higher education architecture, but they were borrowed from Romanesque Italy. And so they reflect, they're kind of a hodgepodge of different cathedrals and churches in uh, Romanesque Italy. Uh, and, but if you still look around the interior, all of the designs you see here are from Romanesque Italy, but they're also from uh, Byzantium and also from Arabic influences. So this building and uh, its accompanying uh, uh, sister of uh, Royce Hall brings together that international sense. And so we are kicking off International Week here in the embrace of an international culture, an international, a symbol of international culture. And there's one other thread that I think is important. You're going to hear soon from uh, Kelsey Martin, the dean of the Ge David Geffen School of Medicine. And that medicine part is also important because it was through those cultures, Byzantine, Romanesque Italy, and the Arabs especially, that the medical training and wisdom of the ancient world got transmitted into Europe and ultimately in the 18th and 19th centuries transformed into what we know of as modern medicine. And uh, so there's an international background to medicine that we have to acknowledge. It's not just a Western European trait. It's something that we have borrowed from many cultures, uh, in, and very most importantly, the Arabic culture. And today, I think our medical enterprise, our school of medicine, is truly an international school. We train people from all over the world, and we have outposts of training all over the world, whether it's in Malawi, whether it's in China, whether it's in India, in various corners of the world, our medical students, our public health students, our faculty and our researchers are engaged in medicine internationally. So I think it's very fitting that we use medicine to kick off our International Education Week. And with that, I want to welcome Cindy Fan, uh, the genius behind all of this, Vice Provost for International Stuff, and uh, the head of the International Institute, and uh, really the genius behind this week. So, Cindy. Thank you, Scott. You can tell he's a historian. Not only is he a provost, but he's a historian. And I really love this title, Vice Provost for International Stuff. I think it's a very succinct way of, uh, of, of actually um, describing what I do. Um, so my formal title is Vice Provost for International Studies and Global Engagement. My uh, nickname is Secretary of State for UCLA. And so <laughs> um, I was actually just in China last week where the Secretary of State role had a, had a role to play there, yeah, so. Um, so <laughs> I made it back in one piece, okay. 
Um, so International Education Week is actually an initiative by the Department of State and Department of Education um, to promote programs that do two things. One is to pre prepare Americans for a global world, and second is to attract uh, leaders, present and future, from all over the world to come to the United States to study, work, and exchange experiences. About 18 months ago, the International Institute invited several campus units to start our own initiative on campus. And the goal of that initiative is to make International Education Week a campus-wide tradition. So we piloted this initiative last year, 2016 November, and I thought it was a success. It was a success. So we're going to make it bigger and deeper this year. And in fact, this week, there, were, there are more than 40 events in International Education Week, all the way from uh, student contests. Uh, you don't see the, there's some photos at the back. Those are photos taken by students who've done study abroad. Uh, we have information sessions tomorrow. Uh, we have career panel tomorrow evening. Yesterday, I was up in the residence hall. There were fashion show and international dances. And we also have martial arts, free martial arts classes, tai chi, etc. So this is truly multifaceted, a celebration. We also actually have an event in London that just concluded yesterday, a global forum in London as part of International Education Week where two members of the parliament, both Bruins, talked about Brexit. Brexit. So this is truly international, both in spirit and location. And I'd like to, at this point, recognize the organi organizing partners because to to put together this week of events, it takes not only a village, it takes several villages and, and towns and cities and so on. So um, when you hear your unit um, uh, mentioned, please raise your hands because we really wanted to recognize you. Dashu Center for International Students and Scholars, where are you, Dashu Center? Thank you. International Education Office. International Education Office, right there. Thank you. Yumi. UCLA, UCLA Residential Live. There you go. They're the one who put together the fashion show. Um, UCLA Library is to be thanked for providing this space to us for free. <laughs> That's the best part of it. Um, <laughs> And for the first time, the International Student Leadership Coalition has joined us. So, International Student Leadership Coalition. All the students. <laughs> and last but not least, all the staff in the International Institute. You've worked so hard. You've worked so hard for so many months to put this together. I am so grateful. And I know that your Thanksgiving this year is going to be particularly relaxing. <laughs> Thank you. And also, we benefited from 22 co-sponsors from across campus um, who've given us money, important. Um, and also, there are so many units who've organized events throughout this week. So if you have supported us financially or organized units, please raise your hands. We wanted to thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think your enthusi enthusiasm and support is rooted in your commitment to global education and research. And you know the tagline of this year's International Education Week is connecting across borders, connecting across borders. So those, those of you who are wearing international education t-shirts, I, I know some, some of you are. <laughs> we made those t-shirts, where are you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to show you this t-shirt later on tonight. Um, the tagline is there, connecting across borders. And these borders can be continental, international, national, religious, racial, ethnic, um, cultural, geographical, all kinds of borders we wanted to connect across them. And connecting is a mindset, one that appreciates difference and diversity that's one, and recognizes one's limitations, that's another. And 
um, there are many ways to help us and our students in particular to cultivate this kind of mindset. Study abroad, put yourself in um, outside of comfort zone, um, taking a class on world regions or global issues, making friends with international students, or simply just exploring, ex exploring the multicultural and global Los Angeles. So there are multiple ways to do that. Um, two days ago, Alaska Airlines announced that it would terminate its service to Havana, Cuba. Just 10 months ago, I was on the inaugural flight from Los Angeles to Havana on Alaska Airlines. Um, where is Professor Tom Coates? Tom was on that flight. Is Fabiola here? Okay. So, and we were so glad that we took that flight, but now that door is closed. And I truly believe that one of the responsibilities of the university is to keep the doors open and to make more new doors open, is to open more new doors. So I ask you, invite you to join us, to join UCLA in this mission to open even more doors. And as um, Provost Wall mentioned, we have a number of councils general here with us, so welcome to UCLA. We also have alumni, friends, supporters, donors here. We also have UCLA leadership. They tend to sit together on this end. Uh, all the deans and vice chancellors and vice provosts, thank you for coming. We also have students and student organizations, staff. We also have academic senate. Chris Henscom, you represent the Committee of International Education. Thank you for coming. Um, community, we have representatives from schools, airlines, and also sister cities of Los Angeles is represented. So, as we welcome you again, I hope that you will share our enthusiasm and mission about opening doors and about connecting. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kelsey Martin as our keynote speaker tonight. She became Dean of the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA in 2016, and he's the first woman Dean of the medical school. That calls for an applause. Inspired to pursue a medical career by her experience as a Peace Corps volunteer, she entered the MD and PhD program at Yale University, where she studied influenza virus host cell interactions. She went on to complete her postdoctoral training in neurobiology at Columbia University, and she joined UCLA faculty in 1999. Dr. Martin is a professor in the departments of biological chemistry and psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences and directs a productive research laboratory focused on understanding how, exper how experience changes connectivity in the brain to store long-term memories. As I am becoming more forgetful, I am also feeling that I need to talk to her more <laughs> and understand her research. She has received numerous awards, including the Daniel Friedman Award from the National Alliance for Research on Schizophrenia and Depression. And she's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the National Academy of Medicine. At UCLA, Dr. Martin has been a leader in the drive to promote cross-disciplinary cooperation among scientists in neuroscience and other brain-related research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kelsey Martin. Well, thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Scott. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you, all of our friends and guests and colleagues and students. Um, I feel really honored that Keith Terasaki is here because his father did so much for both medicine and international education, so I really appreciate your presence here tonight, and I love being in this library. Um, so I'm, I'm the dean of the medical school. I am a, a molecular neurobiologist. I uh, was telling some of the people earlier that most of the talks I give are about uh, genes and how they change with long-term memory. This is a different kind of talk, and it really does have to do with how my experience changed who I am. 
and what I did in my life, but I also want to take a step back as the dean of the medical school and just begin to talk about what I think is so important about international education for future physicians and for future biomedical researchers. And I want to start um, with, so I just want to start actually with um, something that one of our faculty members, a junior faculty in pediatrics, um, Elizabeth Bernert, sent to me yesterday. It was from an op-ed that came out in the LA Times on Monday, and she sent it to me as something that she thought was important for us to be thinking about as we train uh, future physicians. And it was an op-ed that was written by the Dalai Lama. And what it says, um, and actually started by talking about our current administration, talking about our goal of making America best and come first, and then went on to say that there are no national boundaries for climate protection or the global economy, no religious boundaries either. The time has come to understand that we are the same human beings on this planet. Whether we want to or not, we must coexist. The educational systems of the future should place greater emphasis on strengthening human abilities, such as warm-heartedness, a sense of oneness, humanity, and love. And so for me, as a dean of a medical school, it's important to me that our students learn the tremendous amount of information that's required to understand clinical medicine, but that they also learn this important, um, what the Dalai Lama called the education of the heart. Back in 1948, the United Nations set out its Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and Article 25 specifically said that everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family. It should have been herself and her family, but that's 1948. Um, and then at least they went on in the next um, part to say motherhood and childhood are entitled to special care and assistance. All children, whether born in or out of wedlock, shall enjoy the same social prote project protection. So um, there is an enormous amount of health inequity in the world. Uh, these are just some uh, facts that come from the World Health Organization. Every day, 16,000 children die before their fifth birthday. They die from infectious diseases like pneumonia, and uh, malaria, other diarrheal diseases. They're 14 more times more likely to die before the age of five in sub-Saharan Africa than in the rest of the world. And children from rural and poor households um, are disproportionately affected. Maternal health and mor maternal mortality is a key indicator of health inequity. And there are enormous gaps in maternal health between poor and wealthy countries, uh, both within countries and between countries. Developing countries account for 99% of annual maternal deaths in the world. Women in Chad, in Africa, have a lifetime risk of maternal death that's one in 16, whereas in Sweden that risk is less than one in 10,000. There's tremendous differences in life expectancy between countries. That differences varies by 34 years. And in low-income uh, countries, the average lifespan is 62 years, but it's 81 years in wealthier countries. A child that's born in Sierra Leone can expect to live 50 years. A child born in Japan can expect to live 84 years. So we know that there's a lot about biology, which I've spent my entire career working on, that can be used to take care to address uh, human health and disease. And most studies predict that that accounts for about 20% of the outcomes in health, and that another 80% is due to the social, economic, uh, environment and to behavioral aspects of, of um, society. One of the great indicators of health disparities is wealth 
inequity. So if you look at a Gini index, an index of how much difference there is between the wealthiest and the poorest, and you look, you can see that, and I'm sorry my pointer doesn't work on here, but if you look at the higher Gini coefficient, that means where there's more disparity between the wealthiest and the poorest, life expectancy is actually significantly shorter than if you look where there's less uh, disparity in wealth and then life expectancy is longer. So these are global numbers, but we live in an international city in Los Angeles, and you just look at a map of Los Angeles, and you can see in this uh, lookup table here in orange, it goes from the really light color being about 75 years and the very dark color being about 90 years. There's that much difference in life expectancy in our own county. If you live in Malibu, your life expectancy is 89.8 years. If you live in Compton, your life expectancy is 78.4 years. And those are not the extremes. So that tells us that there's a huge amount for us working in health in, in trying to understand different environments and really trying to understand what the determinants are that contribute to those sorts of inequities. Health care in our county is divided into what are called service provider areas, or SPAs. And they're shown here on this map with different colors. We live in SPA 4, the orange right in the center. SPA 6 is right next to us, right below us in that kind of dark uh, magenta color. Uh, the Los Angeles County Department of Health puts out different statistics. This is from last year. And if you just look at those different spa, those different service provider areas, all within our own county, and I, I know this is hard to read, but at the bottom it says health-related quality of health. The percent of adults reporting their health to be fair or poor. And if you look, for example, in, in this, the county, the spa that uh, we're in, um, it is, uh, we, if, or if you look at the west, which is further west, you can see that, we, uh, that that area does better than average. If you look at spa six, it does significantly worse than average. These are not dis great distances, although traffic can make it seem that way, but they're really not great distances from one another, and yet there are these tremendous disparities. If you look at health outcomes, so how do we do in terms of taking care of individuals? And you look at um, how many, uh, what percent of adults are obese? Okay, and you look in the West spa, it's 10%. And you look in the South spa, it's 34%. Again, we're neighbors, and yet there's this enormous disparity in terms of obesity, a major uh, risk factor for a variety of diseases. If you look at diabetes, and you look at diabetes death rate per 100,000 population. In the West, LA, it's 7.5 per 100,000. In South, it's 37.6 per 100,000. Again, so that incorporates both differences in the health, but it also tells us something about how we're providing health care and what the differences in how we're reaching those populations our neighbors, really, in, our, in the city, in the same, our, 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 they are our neighbors. And again, there's about 20% of this that's contributed to by clinical care. 80% is contributed to by the socioeconomic environment. So I consider that as the dean of a medical school, it's really critical that as we train future physicians and as a scientist, as we train future biomedical sciences, scientists who are going to be thinking about what's the cause of disease, that they understand those elements as well, those contributors. So I'm actually going to switch gears a little bit and tell this from a more personal perspective. And I'm going to tell five stories. And one of them is an old story. And so that's why that picture looks so fuzzy up in the in the left because that's a picture of me in the early 1980s uh, as a Peace Corps volunteer in what was then Zaire and is now the Democratic Republic of, of Congo. 
And then I'm gonna tell the stories of four of our trainees in the David Geffen School of Medicine. Lao Tzu Alan Blitz, who's a medical student, Huan Dong, who's a medical student, Ags Oforjebe, who is a medical student, and Sarah Gustafson, who's a chief resident in pediatrics. So I grew up in middle class Seattle, Washington. I went to uh, Harvard as an undergraduate, and I was really interested in how people behave, and I, I was an English major, so I have to say I spent a lot of time in the library. And um, actually, I'm going to come back to that. And when I um, finished college as an English major, I wasn't really um, sure exactly what I wanted to do, but it, this was, uh, I'll date myself even more, <laughs> in the late 1970s, and I lived in a communal house in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I, together with my housemates, really believed that the ills of the world were due to Western imperialism, and I wanted to go out and, and fight Western imperialism. And so at that time, I joined the Peace Corps. And uh, I had uh, spent two years in France in high school, so I spoke French, but I was an English major. I didn't want to go teach English in the Peace Corps. I wanted to do something like healthcare or agriculture um, or fish culture, something that I felt was practical. And so I went and I, I argued that if I went to a French-speaking country, I would learn how to you know, do something that required a skill set other than reading and writing papers. <laughs> um, and so I ended up being uh, placed in Zaire, um, which is uh, in a village that was really in the middle of the country, a village called Bibanga, extremely rural village. Here you can see you, you land up there, you have to walk about 10 kilometers to get a truck that will take you to the nearest city that's called Mbujumai or Goat Water. Um, I spoke French, but nobody here spoke French, but... Uh, um, and I was told that I was supposed to set up a center for... Uh, to treat children with severe malnu malnutrition. And so I spent about six months working on this and realized very quickly that this was not a, a, a good approach because the women did all the work there and they would bring their one child who had Kwashioka or Marasmus to this uh, village where there was a hospital and leave their other children at home and then they would get malnourished. So, um, you know, after spending a lot of time and I would say that really one of the great things for me as a then 21 year old is I went to a place that had no infrastructure and I read books. I knew how to read books. I read a lot of books. I read a great book called Where There Is No Doctor um, that's still used all over the world for training. And you know, after reading all those books, I decided I have to take a step back and do more community organizing. I have to do community organizing around uh, really basic uh, preventive health programs. Uh, uh, things, for example, there's a lot of death, of uh, perinatal death, and it comes from cutting the umbilical cord with a dirty uh, razor blade. And so teaching how to sterilize that razor blade, um, things like that, uh, and set up a vaccination program. So completely preventive health, and it was community organizing. It was figuring out how to work in a large rural area of about 30,000 where there are no roads. How do you, vaccines have to be refrigerated and there's no electricity, so you find the people who own the bars and they have a petrol run refrigerator and you make a deal that they'll keep your vaccines at nighttime, so at daytime you can do the vaccination programs. We got a grant for a motorcycle. There's no motorcycle repair, so you read the motorcycle repair book and you figure out how to repair the motorcycle. So it really is a great training for a dean, right? It's all the things that you don't, you know, there's nobody tells you how to do, and you figure out how to do them. So this is me in the village that I lived in, in Bibanga. Um, and this, I put together a healthcare team. We set up programs to do uh, um, child and maternal health care, uh, trained village health care workers, um, and uh, you know, spent a lot of time trying to talk about boiling water and uh, to sterilize things, which is quite, quite difficult when you live in a place that's deforested. So economically, you can't really tell people to go set up a fire and 
and, and, and uh, boil their needles. Um, I love drawing, so I put together uh, visual aids for the training. This Mbudimum uh, Bipita Buanga means um, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure in this language in Chaluba, and it's how to uh, be strong in your body. And it, we did things in the training, which were uh, baby weighing programs, uh, vaccinations, classes, uh, uh, talking about malarial treatment. But of all these things, the one thing that was by far the most effective um, and that really struck me were, was this vaccination program. And one year, we set up a vaccination program and vaccinated the whole rural zone and every October, there was always a measles epidemic. And it was, it was, it was deadly for, for y very young children and for very elderly. And it always came at the same time. It was in the month that was called the month of the flying ants, because it was in October when all the termites came. And that year, there was no <laughs> a measles epidemic. So it really had a very strong impact on me. And my Dad is actually a physician scientist who his whole life wanted me to be a scientist and I had rebelled very, you know, as, as much as I could against that. But here I was in the middle of the, you know, the Congo in this little village and had realized what the power of vaccines were. So of course, he sent me as many books as he could about the scientists who actually learned how to grow the viruses, John Enders, and growing those viruses could be used to make vaccines, people like Jonas Salk. And that was totally inspiring to me. I felt that I had gone, and I have great and deep appreciation in my life for literature and poetry, but having gone to a place in the world where there was so much suffering and so much uh, um, death and, and, and injustice and feeling that I was somewhat empty-handed, but that I then could learn uh, you know, contribute in a way, really changed the course of my own education. So I came back, I did all my pre-med work, um, I ended up working in a lab looking at HIV transmission, and I ended up discovering that I actually really loved doing research. And so, you know, at that point, I, I went down this path of doing an MD-PhD and becoming a scientist, but when I go back and I look at uh, my journal, and I'm very lucky that my husband is a historian, so he keeps all of this stuff. <laughs> and so this was written when I was uh, like 22 years old, and I wrote, why there won't be health for anyone by the year 2000. Corruption, chaos, lack of quality control, lack of resources, people selling medicine, I wrote about you know more corruption, um, what the government does, and then I wrote hopeful things. Well-trained, earnest young MDs. <laughs> and then I wrote about a couple of the people I'd worked with, um, and about uh, you know, the development of systems for healthcare. And then I wrote, basic problems are political, economic, and cultural. So again, I find some irony that having gone from being a a molecular neurobiologist devoted to my own research. I'm now the dean of a medical school, but when I go back and I read this, I feel that fate was sort of telling me all along where I would end up. So I'm gonna go backwards here because I put this too early. Um, because we in the medical school are incredibly fortunate to have the UCLA Center for World Health. And the Center for World Health provides an opportunity for our trainees and our faculty, uh, for our community to really um, gain substantial experiences working in other countries. And I wanted to in particular acknowledge Tom Coates, who's the director of our, our Center for World Health, and Lee Miller, who's the director of the medical education programs. Because I think, you know, I, I certainly didn't have this, but I think having the opportunity to engage in a really significant way definitely changes who our children, or who our children, who our students. <laughs> My children would be insulted to hear that, but <laughs> become. So, um, so I do want to tell a couple of, sto of stories about our um, four of our trainees, and one of them, uh, Ogs 
Ofor Jebe in the yellow sweater here, um, who is, I put her as an MS3 plus because she's finished three years of medical school and now she's taking an extra year so she'll come back and do a final year. And she's had really significant international experiences working in Botswana and also in Malawi. Um, she actually came to the David Geffen School of Medicine with a lot of international experience. She'd worked for five years uh, before she came uh, and it, uh, in uh, Botswana and largely running programs for Princeton where she was an undergraduate. Uh, when she came here, she one of the reasons that she came here because she want, knew she wanted to do more global health. And the summer after her first year, she participated in a our summer short-term training program in uh, Botswana and worked with one of our faculty members, Jeff Klauster. And then um, in the, her second year, became very active in running global health programs in Los Angeles. And then at the end of her third year, she was awarded a, a very competitive and, and prestigious NIH Fogarty uh, GloCal Fellowships um, to go back with one, another one of our faculty members, Risa Hoffman, um, to look at self-testing in, ide in identifying infected in HIV infected individuals in Malawi, and that's where she is right now. So she'll come back next year, and she'll graduate with the class of 2019 as a member of our global health pathway. And what um, Ags told me is that what really stood out for her in UCLA's program was that there was a real emphasis on career development that before everything she'd done was working on program implementation, and she had no research, and this is actually a picture of her with her team working in Botswana at a place that teaches how to do qualitative research. And, um, and I also note that she is the first author in a relatively recently published paper, so she really went the entire route of becoming very immersed in international uh, education. So um, then the second student is Lao Tzu Alan Blitz, who I think his parents put quite a number of, of expectations on him, because I have to tell you what his name is, okay? And thank you, Lee, for sharing this with me. Lao Tzu, Seattle, Shankara, Spinoza, Socrates, Siddhartha, Alan Blitz. Okay, so um, I think the expectations were high for, for Lao Tzu. <laughs> And Lau has actually lived up to those expectations. So after his first year uh, as a medical student, he um, did one of the summer short-term uh, projects working in Botswana, um, looking at, uh, at uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, and again, working with Jeff Klausner. So again, I have to tell you how grateful I am to our faculty for really bringing our students um, and training them and mentoring them in this way. Um, when he was a third year, so here he is working on the TB study. Uh, when he was a third year student, he received another NIH funded um, award to work on uh, HIV prevention in Lima, Peru, uh, and uh, worked on predictive models for syphilis in high risk populations, and looked at other uh, um, uh, infectious diseases that occurred in the same individuals. Uh, he is going to be traveling this spring uh, to Titswalo in South Africa to do a rural clinical elective and is going to graduate uh, in 2019, 2018, uh, also as a member of the Global Health Pathway. And here is Lau with his team in Botswana. And, um, you know, what he told me was he was able to work with all these clinics and also in the laboratory. It was an amazing experience because he learned so much about research, international work, statistics, and different cultures. And this guy, six, published six papers from his international experiences. So um, the third student I'm gonna tell you about is Huang Dong, who is a third year medical student. And I do wanna point out that both Ags and Huang are students in, in the Charles uh, our Drew University uh, program, medical school, and that's a collaboration we have with Charles R. Drew or CDU University. CDU is in Watts. It was set up after about 50 years ago after the LA riots to really um, uh, train uh, physicians to 
provide health care to underserved populations. It enriches our class enormously. So Juan, um, as a first year medical student, also worked with Jeff Klausner, uh, worked in Hanoi in Vietnam, uh, and then he was awarded an NIH Fogarty Glocal Fellowship to look at uh, antibiotic resistant gonorrhea. And really, his work identified antibiotic use as a driver of some of the changes in the microbiome that make individuals more or less susceptible to other infections. So he's going to be graduating uh, next year also in the global health pathway. And what he told me, and this is a guy who was speaking so quickly, he's so excited about what he's doing, that the opportunity to be the designer and the study coordinator of this pro research project, the experience working with clinics, community organizations, laboratories in a crowded city in a developing nation, challenging himself in terms of the Vietnamese language as well as culturally sensitive ways to recruit participants from the hidden LGBT community. Um, so this has clearly had an impact on Juan's um, career, and he's given presentations recently at the NIH, but also at a, uh, at a conference in Japan about his research. And then the last person is our current chief, one of the current chief residents in pediatrics, Sarah Gustafson, who um, uh, was one, when she was also a medical student at UCLA, and she was one of the students who lobbied for the creation of a new global health selective at the David Geffen School of Medicine. Uh, this, she sent me this slide, and it has six trips to Ghana. I believe now she's up to seven, so it's kind of outdated. Um, so she, again, taking the summer short-term uh, uh, project, went to Ghana, uh, and she's uh, started working in malarial prevention efforts, but became very interested in things that are dear to my heart, really, and that has to do with infant mortality with practices around birth and about training to uh, um, address some of the reasons why there's such high infant mortality in the village in Ghana where she was working. Um, she graduated in 2014 as one of the first global health pathway uh, graduates, and then throughout her training, uh, her residency training as, as a chief resident, she's continued to work on Ghana, and she's actually herself become a mentor for many of our uh, students. Um, so here, what she says is community partnership is critical for understanding local context, implementation of projects, deciding next step. I believe that global health work must be done with a mentor with shared values who helps instill cultural humility flexibility and, and perseverance. And actually, here she is with Emily Wong, who was one of our medical students who um, has finished her internal medicine uh, residency here as well. So um, again, I want to really acknowledge the UCLA Center for World Health. Their motto is saving lives and improving health by investing in people. Um, but I also want to point out, as the dean of the medical school, how important it is for us to also reach out not only to our international, across the global borders, but across the borders that exist in our own city. We live in a city with over 10 million people, no ethnic ma majority, 92 languages are spoken in Los Angeles, 23% um, of our population is under the age of 18, and there's a 15-year life expectancy gap that separates the healthiest and the at-risk populations in our city. So I want to thank you. Um, I really appreciate your being here, and I'm happy to answer any questions.